You are listening to This is Oklahoma, hosted by Mike Hearn, telling stories of Oklahomans and those that have made it their home. What's up, guys? Welcome back to another episode of This is Oklahoma podcast. Mike Hearn here, your host, back with another episode. Excited to share this episode with you today. But before we do, I've got to thank our sponsors. First of all, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame. They've been a huge part of this podcast for the last few years. So the Oklahoma Hall of Fame have been sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com. And for daily updates, go to Oklahoma HOF on Instagram and give them a follow. Our other sponsor today is the Chickasaw Nation. Now, the Chickasaw Nation have sponsored pretty much everything in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma. And it's an honor to have their name and their brand supporting this podcast. So a huge shout out to Governor Anatoby for supporting this podcast. It really means a lot. And finally, our third sponsor is 988. The Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline, 988 is a direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. That's 988oklahoma.com. And now, let's get into today's episode. My guest today is Chef Shannon Smith, uh, at Chef Shannon Smith on Instagram and chefshannon.com. I'll put the links below. You can go check that out. But I am a terrible cook. I stay as far away from the kitchen as possible. Uh, my George Foreman is my best friend. That's about the extent of my cooking career and a microwave. So I'm really excited to dive into learning today about, I mean, all the stuff that you do. You seem to have traveled a lot. You Clearly, you cook a lot and you host events and everything is around food. But before we dive into that thing, tell me a little bit about you. Tell me about your, your history, your background, and, and growing up in Tulsa. Well, I'm excited to be on today because I love Oklahoma. And since that's what this podcast is about, I've lived in Oklahoma my entire life. But I travel right now I'm traveling probably 40% of the year. I've been to 52 countries, many of them multiple times. And I love coming back to the state of Oklahoma. I live in Tulsa, but I grew up in um, the Oklahoma City area. Uh, went to high school, middle school and high school in Tuttle, mm-hmm. which is southwest of Oklahoma City, and had a wonderful life there. My, my father was um, an accountant, and his dream was to be a cowboy. Oh, really? Yeah. So when I was in seventh grade, he and my mother found this ranch out in Tuttle, and it had 180 acres, and he, he moved my sisters and me out there, and I was a little ranch girl in yeah. Tuttle. Uh, but one of the highlights of growing up and going to Tuttle High School was my home economics teacher. Mm-hmm. That was Miss Craig. She was my uh, home ec teacher all four years of high school. And I learned a lot from her. I My mom was not a great cook. She cooked because she had to. And, you know, I grew up on canned food and, uh, you know, casseroles, TV dinners, things like that. And so I didn't really know how to cook that much. I didn't enjoy it. And, but I learned a lot from this home economics teacher. But what I really loved was sewing. And my mother sewed all my clothes growing up. And so that's what I started doing when I was a little girl was sewing. And eventually, um, through the inspiration of my mom and Miss Craig, who I wanted to be when I grew grew up, uh, I went to college at Oklahoma Christian. Mm -hmm. It was Oklahoma Christian College at the time. Now it's a university. And uh, got my home economics degree there and went on to graduate school to study design at Oklahoma State. Yeah. And this was all in sewing. and, And so cooking was not part of my life at that time. And I moved to Tulsa, uh, married a guy at OSU, Mm -hmm. moved me to Tulsa. I had never been to Tulsa. And really, none of my friends had ever been to Tulsa. It was like another state. And kind, you know, it's, I think it's getting a little better now. Mm -hmm. Um, But anyway, came to Tulsa and started a sewing business. And I sewed for about uh, 12 years. And uh, my claim to fame on that is I've sewn at least 500 bridesmaids dresses in my lifetime, wow. or in that career, I should say. That yeah. was kind of my my niche. But uh, it was very hard on me. 
um, on my body, on my, uh, it was emotionally and, you know, very straining. Mm -hmm. And uh, unfortunately, my marriage was failing at the time. I had, we had two uh, very young children. Uh, And so I decided to make a change, made a lot of changes, actually. But one was to change careers. And I got a job here in Tulsa teaching cooking to underprivileged kids at an apartment complex, Uh, as well as uh, Catholic Charities had a a, um, shelter for unwed mothers. And they asked me to come there and cook also through this nonprofit. And I finally got to become a teacher, which is what I always wanted to do, like Miss Craig. And I love teaching so much, and I loved teaching these kids, And but I didn't know much about how to cook very well. I mean, I could teach them, you know, the basics and kind of nutritious meals and how to cook, um, you know, food from food stamps, which Mm -hmm. is how they were basically getting their food. So I went to a culinary school here in Tulsa. And for four years, I learned everything I could. I got a lot of confidence. I remarried. And that man took started taking me around the world traveling. Mm-hmm. And I loved traveling. I had gone to, through Oklahoma Christian, I had spent a, a semester abroad. And that's when I kind of got the travel bug. But it wasn't until 15 years later that I got to go, you know, abroad again with, yeah. with my husband. But... After several trips, I felt like I was missing something because we would go and see all the touristy things, uh-huh. and which was fine, but I had this yearning to meet the people, to actually immerse myself into the culture uh-huh. and, and learn about these people, and it, so I decided to do that, to yeah. make that part of what I, you know, my cooking career. So I, on another trip, and this one was to Italy, um, I asked my husband if I could, you know, take cooking lessons and just do kind of do some different things. And I got on the internet, and this was 12 years ago, Mm -hmm. and I really had to search for people that might teach me. And I found a woman in Rome named Diane Seed. She was an expat from from uh, Great Britain, but had mm-hmm. been there 40 years, and she taught uh, Italian cooking lessons in her apartment. Oh, wow. And she normally did um, these gourmet tours where she took very small groups to different countries and different places around mm-hmm. Italy, and she would teach cooking, you know, kind of on the side. And she was not really particularly interested in teaching me for only one day. That wasn't her thing. She liked yeah. to spread it out. But I talked her into it, and we became very good friends. And as a result, I went back many times to Rome uh, to study with her, and I went on a lot of trips with her. Uh-huh. And she was a single woman, and she traveled a lot, and it was through her that I gained confidence to travel alone. Yeah. And I started doing a lot of that. I And, and with her, I went to India, um, Turkey, Morocco, Sri Lanka, Sicily. Um, I can't remember. Several other places. But on those trips, I met additional people. Uh-huh. And I started getting confidence that yeah. I can do this. And um, so over the past few years, I've just... I've, I've been back to Italy probably 25 times, um, kind of had a similar experience in Bologna, meeting a family there that um, taught me, took me on market tours, taught me a lot just about um, Bolognese, Bolognese food and the food from that area. I've been back there three times. They're like family to me. They've actually come here and stayed yeah. with me. But I've done this really all over the world. And then I... And at the same time, I was teaching cooking here in Tulsa, Mm -hmm. um, mostly to adults, to some kids, um, some homeschooled kids, too. But um, I thought, you know, and this is really over the past five years, I thought I I can do dinners based on all these places that I've been. And that's what I started doing are these I call them experiential dinners, Mm -hmm. which are kind of they're really pop ups. And I have a beautiful backyard, so I mostly do them, you know, during the 
season, you know, cooler weather. And they are all based on a country or a cuisine from where I've cooked. And for example, this week I'm doing a night in Morocco, which is a six course dinner um, with all Moroccan yeah. dishes. And I was just there, I've, I've been there twice. I was just there last April, so it's really fresh on my mind. And plus I bring back ingredients to use mm-hmm. in those um, in those dinners. So that was a very long answer to how, but but that's yeah. the very condensed yeah, yeah, yeah. answer too. Well, there's so much to unpack there too, because like it's, you know, growing up in Tuttle, kind of rural on, you know, kind of in that environment, kind of being, like I said, you know, growing up like a bit of a farm girl and mm-hmm. doing stuff there it all comes kind of full circle because now you appreciate where the food comes from, right? And all of the the kind of the stuff that goes into buying locally and it all makes sense. But unpacking that stuff, like what, you know, going back to Miss Craig and your love of kind of teaching and her home economics class and just, you know, now, I'm sure now she'd be extremely proud of you because she's like, yeah, I'm teaching, but you Mm -hmm. found something you love to do and you love, you know, love teaching it. Um, but so, so growing up, you wanted to be creative, and after learning how to sew, you were like, this is my thing. I can be creative, and I can go into the sewing, and obviously you mm-hmm. ran with that. And 500 bridesmaid dresses is yeah. a lot of brides. That's is. a lot of brides it and is. a lot of bride mothers, too, to right. deal with. <laughs> so where does the entrepreneurial thing come from, though? Because you've got to be pretty entrepreneurial to, to be like that. I mean, does that come from mom and dad? Probably so. But, you know, my my father did, he owned a, his own firm. In fact, it was uh, it was called Merle Hall Macintosh and Company. It was the uh, largest privately owned CPA firm at the time in Oklahoma. And um, yeah, but, you know, he was so busy. I didn't see he was a, he was a wonderful father. I had a great childhood, but I didn't see him a lot because he was running his own business. And as a result, I didn't learn a lot from him sure. about business. So I I don't know. I've never thought of myself as an entrepreneur, but mm-hmm. I guess that is the case. Yeah. I mean, I've always worked for myself, really. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not particularly good at, you know, the money part of it. I fortunately have a team of people that do that for me. Yeah. Um, so that's I'm lucky that I c- can... Mm-hmm can do that and just really focus my energy and time on the creative side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that's I mean, a true creative, right? Yeah. Like uh, like an artist. I want to do my creative stuff and I'll find a team to take right. care of all the stuff that takes energy from me. <laughs> that's true. I hate numbers and accounting too. Uh, tell me about kind of when you go to go to OSU as, as a, you know, to go into design at OSU. Mm-hmm. Well, and, and at that time, it seems like your passion and your career was, I am going to be a designer. I'm going to go do the sewing thing. That's true. And so my senior year of, of my undergrad, mm-hmm. I went to, you know, was at Oklahoma Christian. That's when I went to yeah. Vienna, Austria for the semester. And I, that was, you know, I was, had gone, you know, Oklahoma Christian, especially at that time, was extremely strict. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I grew up in an extremely strict home. And I was a little bit of a rebel. I was the oldest of three daughters, mm-hmm. and I. it was like I was unleashed when I got to go to Europe. Yeah. And so I had a lot of fun and developed an attitude, to be honest, and was like, I'm going back to Oklahoma. I'm getting out of there. I'm going to New York. I was just this real little snot about it. And I'm certainly never going to marry an Oklahoma boy. That mm-hmm. was, I was determined that would never happen. Um, but I think once I got home, back on home turf, I think reality sunk in. And I'm like, you know, okay, let's see what I'm really going to do. And, uh, you know, I chose to go to Oklahoma State really because I didn't know what I was going to do. Yeah. I mean, I graduate with this degree. Um, I in, in the beginning, I wanted to be a home economics teacher. But what happened was, I, um, by the time I got to the end of, my, of college, I had to do a teaching, what is student teaching or mm-hmm. whatever. Yeah. Um, and I was put into a school in North Oklahoma, northern Oklahoma City, and it was a terrible experience. Yeah. It was just, it was so terrible. The, ch- the kids were so disrespectful. They didn't love home ec, and I couldn't understand how you couldn't love home ec. And the teacher didn't love teaching, yeah. 
And so I'm stuck in here witnessing this and thought, you know what, if this is what it really is like, you know, A, I had a great experience and I'm thankful for that. And B, I cannot do this the rest of my life. So I dropped the education minor and um, decided I can't do that. So so now what right. was kind of what happened. And so I chose to go to Oklahoma State to my parents' dismay because they went to Oklahoma University. Yeah. Um, but I had a great experience there too. I met, you know, I, I, I really said I learned in those, in that year and a half, I mm-hmm. learned more academically than I did in four years of undergrad. Right. Um, but it was also, again, I was a little unleashed at a state university. And that's, you know, of course, when I met my first husband. And um, so that's why I went and really, again, didn't know what I, you know, it, yeah, it sounded great. I'm going to go to New York and be a designer. Mm-hmm. And, of course, I married the Oklahoma boy I s- swore I would never do. But, you know what? Things have worked out. Things work out for a reason, right? <laughs> yeah. All of this stuff happens for a reason. Right. And, like, that's that's the beauty of it is that, you know, when when you when you look back, you're like, timing happens and things happen for a reason but it's really you know looking back that trip to Vienna really opened your eyes to the rest of the world and that's one thing why I and I say this pretty much every other podcast is like I I really want people to travel you know I want people to see the rest of the world and get out of their hometown and get out of the state and Mm -hmm. you know even if it's this you know the beauty of this country is it's so big go to a different state and and but if you can go to a place that doesn't speak the same language you learn so much, right? You also learn how to think on your feet fast. You're in a different country. Like, there's so many benefits to travel. But for you, being at that young age, going to Vienna mm-hmm. and being like, I'm, a, I'm away. Like, no one's really, you know, like, I can go do my own thing, you know? And I'm right. kind of under, like, the, probably the watchful eye of your parents and peers. And you're like, you know, you don't have that, you know, what if someone sees what I do and tells my parents kind of growing up, you know, in, in a quite probably a Christian environment, mm-hmm. right? And that environment. And, you know, I went to Southern Nazarene, so I kind of get this, the, the total scene of OC and Southern Nazarene. Like, it's, it's, you know, you're totally right. Like, you're unlocked at this point. And like, wow, the rest of the world is like this. And I'm, I'm not surprised that you had a little bit of an attitude and a little bit of a chip mm-hmm. on your shoulder because you're like, I can do this, right? right? And you go back to Oklahoma with this world travel experience. And you're like, you know what? I'm going to make something of myself. I want to travel. I mm-hmm. want to, and, and that kind of, Clearly, that is, you know, centered in your love of travel, going right, right back to that moment. And, and you know, the 10 years that I was married to to that man and, and worked so hard. I mean, I was working 16-hour days, mm-hmm. you know, sewing for the very elite of Tulsa. Yeah. You know, as, as hard as that was, those years really helped develop me. So, you, you know, you talk about the entrepreneurial um, aspect of this. If, if anything... Those years, um, I mean, I, I grew up on a farm yeah. or on a ranch. I, I grew up working hard. I mean, that was, it was required. And then, you know, now I'm working hard, you know, with the, you know, as a, in a sewing business because yeah. it was out of necessity. But those were very formative years for me mm-hmm. because now, you know, many years later, I don't really have to work, to right. be honest. But I work very, very hard now. It's just in me. Yeah. And, and so I'm thankful for those years that I, um, that I sewed, you know, day and night. Yeah. It's and ingrained in you, right? And back it, to what you said about right. your dad. It's like, look, he was a great dad, but he was also never around because he was working so hard. Right. And again, comes full circle. You totally get it now. I do. At the time, you're like, why isn't dad home? I'm like, well, he's working. Right. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah, there's no doubt that, you know, like, what you said to set great context of telling, you know, the story, but tell me about then that decision to go from the design thing into the food business. Cause you know, you think you didn't grow up, mom wasn't a great cook. You didn't grow up around, you know, great cuisine and, and mm-hmm. probably adventurous cuisine too. Right. And now you are probably the most adventurous person that I know with the right. cuisine. Right. And you made a business out of it. So tell me about kind of that period in your life where you make that decision to go into, you know, becoming a chef and, having that chef title? Well, you know, I think going back to that, when I decided to, um, to go to the culinary school here, Mm -hmm. I did that because by teaching those kids, 
I learned a very valuable lesson. This was taught in an apartment, an empty apartment here in Tulsa, um, and it was state-funded housing. Okay, so these are um, impoverished kids. Mm -hmm. So half of the complex was blacks, and the other half was Russians. Mm -hmm. And I was told that they didn't get along, which was truth. They didn't necessarily yeah. get along for whatever reason. But these kids were told they could go to a cooking class after school and get fed, basically. So, And that was their motivation. They were going to get a good snack. So these kids would come, and I would teach them, and we would, you know, play games and, and eat. And what I saw was that food w brought these kids together. These were these kids were developing friendships mm -hmm. and relationships because of the food and the environment I was providing. And so for me, that was my first really aha moment of food brings people together. Someone once told me it's hard to cuss with your mouth full. <laughs> and it's the truth. When you are, you know, com communing with someone and with food, yeah. it's hard to have an argument, um, you know, when you're enjoying a good meal. Mm -hmm. So I think from that, I thought, you know, I want to make this bigger. And I loved teaching these kids. Uh, so now I want to teach more kids yeah. and I want to teach adults. And so at the time I'm teaching these impoverished, I hate to use that word, but that's mm -hmm. all I can, uh, these yeah. underprivileged yeah. kids. And then I was teaching these mm -hmm. very elite, mostly women that yeah. were coming to my home. And so I had a, a very broad you know, spectrum yeah. of people. And I just, I loved it. And I loved the feedback I was getting. I'm, I am a good teacher yeah. naturally and I enjoy it, which is an important part of yeah. being good at something. And so that's how it all evolved. Yeah. Yeah. For me, like being a golfer, people say, oh, you're good at golf. You should teach me. And I'm like, no, you don't want that to happen. Yeah. I don't want that to happen yeah. because I'm not going to enjoy it. And also you, you don't want to learn the way that I learn, yeah. right? People who teach have a gift and it, most of the time it's natural you know, you have to have some natural ability, but back to your point, you have to want to give and, and pour into kids. Yeah. Um, and the thing, you know, I, I was on a, a couple of years ago, I did the regional food bank kind of young professional board, which is like a year long thing. And I was shocked to know that the stats around food and the, po the, the, the food poverty, right? You know, like some of these kids... And it's so simple. It's food, right? Yeah. You know, we don't think of this stuff, but right. just the, the the education around food. And and one of the comments that we, you know, we'd had and we, we, you know, we met every month and did this class and, you know, like some of the kids who had grown up didn't know the difference. You know, they, they thought that they're like, I think it was like peaches. They thought that they, their peach came from a can. Yeah. You know, and like that broke my heart. I'm like, mm -hmm. you need to try fresh peaches. And then, you know, then I think they'd given the way and the kid was like, what is this? Like, right. Oh, it's a peach. You know? Well, no, my peaches come from a can. And just that, like the stuff that we're generally not aware of, but for, for these, sadly, for these families and these kids growing up, this is, that's their life. Mm -hmm. And and just like the benefits of food and, and, you know, like that's why COVID was so bad because these kids couldn't go to school to get food. You know, and, and it, it's heartbreaking. And thankfully, the Regional Food Bank and other charities are doing great things to, you know, to make that a difference. And obviously, you got tied in with one to go and help these, you know, teach people how to cook. Because, right. I mean, I was fortunate. I didn't learn how to cook. But my mum was a she she was a trained chef, which probably ruined my cooking experience for the future because I didn't have to cook. because She was so good at it. Um, but at the same time, like we, she knew what she was doing. Right. And I have some idea, but. You know, it's such a, a such a privilege to you know, f for for them, but also for you to give back and to have mm -hmm. that experience, and also have that context of like I'm teaching elite Tulsa families how right. to cook, but then the next day you're down there teaching these kids how to cook and probably doing more, you know, building more of like you're probably happier teaching these kids than you are probably teaching these housewives or whoever. That, and that that is true, yeah. and and I. I'll, with with that, I'm going to, if you don't mind, yeah. lead into some of the microfinance work that yeah. I've done uh, with the same thing, teaching underprivileged, mostly women. Um, my husband, who's now an ex-husband, wrote two books on microfinance, which is a banking program that gives small loans to um 
people in impoverished countries, mostly third world countries. And these are people that want to start their own business, but they don't have the capital. And so these banks give these loans to, and it's mostly women that, and, that try to get these loans. And the, the payback rate is very, very high because of the accountability and many other factors. So it's a very successful program. So he had written these two books and we were supporting a lot of these programs around the world. So I knew about it. I knew how it worked. But at the time I was raising young children. So that was all I had to do with it. Um, once my children graduated high school, it, I felt this urge to, to become more involved. Mm -hmm. By that time, my husband had moved on to other things and, and really it wasn't, you know, a big part of our lives at the time. So I thought, I want to go meet these women and teach them cooking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so the first trip that I did was to Dominican Republic. Actually, the first trip I did was to Rwanda. Mm -hmm. And, and I went, uh, as part of a group of microfinance, um, I don't know, donors, sure. I guess, yeah. to kind of watch and see how, how it works. And mm -hmm. it was very powerfully effective for me. Um, I really, uh, I was so impressed and I, I thought, how can I help with this? Mm -hmm. So there was an organization that works with uh, microfinance in Dominican Republic. And I emailed them and said, I would like to, you know, to actually I want to send a check a donation, and I would like you to purchase sewing machines for women that want to learn to sew as a business. Mm -hmm. And they wrote me back and said, thank you very much. We would love to have your check, and but more we would pref prefer or would love for you to come and teach them how to sew on these sewing machines. Well, this was 10 years after, past when I'd quit sewing. Yeah. And... Teaching sewing and teaching cooking are two different things. Teaching sewing is probably like golf. I mean, it's it's very yeah. difficult to teach. I don't enjoy teaching it. I was had been out of the business 10 years. So I write back and I said, thank you very much, but I, I don't teach sewing. I'm a cooking teacher. Well, so I get an email back that said, that's fantastic. You can teach both. <laughs> and... I'm thinking, well, may, yeah. you know, I think this is a sign. I, I need to do this. So yeah. I agreed to go. And, you know, my friends donated um, a lot of fabrics. We put together these kits and all this. I took huge suitcases with me to Dominican Republic. And for people that have, if you've ever been to the DR, you know, there's these lush, wonderful hotels on the beach. It's very glamorous. But what most people don't realize is that just feet behind those yeah. places, are they have no electricity, no running water, and they are extremely poor. And that's where I was, was in these villages. Um, and my goal was to teach them how to cook the foods they grow mm -hmm. or that they can get in their market. I'm not going to go in and try to teach right. them Moroccan food, yeah. you know, and... Plus, they, I spoke, speak no Spanish, and they speak no English. So I had an interpreter Translate, through yeah. the, or a translator, and I spent, um, oh gosh, about a week. Mm -hmm. In the mornings, I would teach cooking lessons, and then at night, or in the afternoons, I taught sewing. And when I showed up, they had purchased 10 sewing machines, and these were um, treadle machines, so they didn't require uh, electricity. They were set up outside under a tin roof and I show up and there are 30 women yeah. to 10 machines and I, I I'm like how am I going to do this a I don't really like to teach you know this is going to be hard right. and you know I don't speak the language and there's 30 of them 10 machines so I thought you know what most of these women are going to go home without a sewing machine yeah. you know they belong to the organization What's the point, you know, unless yeah. they can get a job working right. with a sewing machine, what's the point of teaching them how to use the machine? Mm -hmm. So I pull out a needle and thread and I'm like, this is the, I'm going to teach you Stop how to basics. sew by, by yeah. hand. And uh, by the end of the week, they'd made a coin purse, a tote bag and 
uh, forgot something else. Um, oh, a pot holder with, you know, all the fabrics that I brought. I took a bunch of decorative buttons. They, you know, and it was these, it was a wonderful experience from, I probably got more out of it than they did, which is, you know, a, a typical uh, response. But uh, Easter was coming up uh, in about two weeks, and they had all gotten together and decided they wanted to save their coin purses and tote bags to take to church uh, Easter Sunday as kind of a celebration yeah. of that week. And, I mean, I was elated over that, and I, I loved it. So I went home and uh, was asked a year later to come back to a different part of the island. Mm -hmm. So by, so now I kind of know what to expect. So I asked the facilitator mm -hmm. through the email, I said, would you, when you meet these women, because mm -hmm. I knew she would meet them at their loan meetings, would you ask them if there's something in particular they'd like to learn to cook? Mm -hmm. And she did, and she came back and she said, they want to learn to make Italian food. And I'm thinking, well, I, I, you know, how, how do they know what right. Italian food is? And what am I going to teach them that mm. they have there? You right. know, uh, I'm not going to teach them how to make dried pasta if they yeah, can't get dried right. pasta. Right. So not knowing really what they had, I decided, uh, well, I knew that they did grow potatoes. Okay. So I thought, I'll, I'm going to teach them to make gnocchi. Uh -huh. And... Then I'll teach them to make sauce with the food they grow because they, you know, grow beautiful food there. Mm -hmm. So once I was there, we, I taught 90 people yeah. how to make gnocchi, and we made three different sauces. We made one that was similar to a pesto, only we used uh, cilantro mm -hmm. and part, you know, the herbs that they had there. In fact, they had never seen basil, and I had I had purchased some basil in one of the markets near their village and taken it with me. And they were so fascinated by basil mm -hmm. that I would t I was taking the leaves off and kind of demonstrating what we were what I was do making and tossing the stems in this in this pile. They had told me to put all my my excess food, you know, stems sure. and things like that in this pile to feed the pig. Mm -hmm. And so I was just kind of tossing them over there and I and I see these women coming over and grabbing the stems. And so I asked the translator, so what are they doing? And she went and asked, and she said they are they want to root them and grow them in the garden. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that's what they were doing. It's just you know going through mm -hmm. and finding that. So that was um, very An eye opening experience. for me. Yeah. And it, but so I, I I have done it there. I've done it in Rwanda. I have mm -hmm. I have a real heart for Rwanda. There's a school in Rwanda that I support and. Yeah. Um, I've gone and taught the cooks at the school, you know, how to cook for Americans mm -hmm. is what they, because they have so many Americans that come over to help yeah. work at the school, but these cooks don't know how to feed them. Mm -hmm. And, you know, these youth groups and school groups are coming yeah. and they're teenagers and, you know, they don't want to eat boiled pumpkin, yeah. you know, three times a week and, you know, well, let's see, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. So mm -hmm. I would go and talk. I taught them how to make chocolate chip cookies yeah. because they have the ingredients right. and they grow this beautiful food in Rwanda, but they didn't know you could make pumpkin pancakes Take it for granted. Mm -hmm. um, the foods that, that we have, and you know, especially in Rwanda, they don't, they work so hard, these people, and they don't have time to, yeah. to learn a different way to do something. You mm -hmm. know, they don't even think about that. Yeah. And so it's, it's, fun for them too to take a sweet potato and do something different than just boiling it and eating it yeah definitely and so so you go doing this you're giving back you, you're traveling you find your passion right and then i guess you're thinking you know i can't go to rwanda every week right i've got to you know come home and, and and bring this back home and do stuff here so where do we kind of get to Tell me about the time you first hosted an event then and cooked for people here in, this, in Tulsa. I can't remember the first okay. time because I've always been an entertainer. Okay. I love to throw dinner parties. Sure. Um, I can't remember the first time that I actually charged money for it. <laughs> right. But the response I have gotten over the years has been so positive mm -hmm. and my dinners sell out within a couple of hours, and which is 
very encouraging to me. Yes. It's a unique experience because it's at a home. Mm -hmm. I live right in the middle of Tulsa, so you don't have to go, you know, an hour out of town to a farm or yeah. something like that, which, you know, we have those here, and they're wonderful experiences, but I think I offer something a little more convenient. You mm -hmm. just come right here, um, and and it's... I'm telling stories. I have so many stories about the people I've met around the world and the, the way that I learned, you know, different dishes. So I tell those stories as between courses. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everything, I, I'm a storyteller and yeah. every dish has a story. Um, and that's just something that it, I think is unique and people don't. Right. Not everyone can do that. Yeah. Well, one thing you mentioned, Kenya, when you were going through your story at the start was that you kind of, first time you traveled on your own, it gave you the confidence to travel more. And then that, again, unlocked the rest of the world. Right. And with food, I mean, there's incredible cuisine in every country. So tell, tell me a little bit about that. Tell me about kind of what gave you the confidence to travel. And, and you know, not everyone who goes to Paris is, like, going to get taken and, and Liam Neeson's going to come and save you. Like, you can see the rest of the world. It's generally safer than the media and everyone else says it is. So tell me about kind of traveling and finding that confidence and then, again, unlocking that to going to, you know, uh, what would you say, Morocco, India, mm -hmm. Turkey, and, and some of those great other places. That's a great question because that's something I like to, uh, I mean, I like to talk about and I like to tell people that it is generally safe to travel and mm -hmm. it's even alone. I mean, as a single, you know, white American woman going yeah. into a Muslim country or to Mexico City, which I've been to, you know, three yeah. or four times this year, um, and people warned me it's not safe, you can't go, that's that's garbage. Mm -hmm. You know, you, every city has dangerous locations, has dangerous people. Mm -hmm. uh, now, some are more dangerous than others. There are, are places I won't go. Yeah. Uh, but... Overall, it is, you know, do your research ahead of time. I mean, I I have been to, I've never been in, or felt endangered. Um, I do, uh, you know, I carry myself well, and I think that's important. Uh, you've got to make good choices. You can't go, you know, don't go out at night to right. sketchy areas. Um, but traveling alone, I often meet um, friends, you know, so I may be traveling alone, but I may mm -hmm. meet up with friends, you know, from other places. Yeah. Uh, or, uh, you know, I might take a friend for part of the trip or something like yeah. that. The other thing is I, ha I have guides. And that's, um, for example, in India. Mm -hmm. I'm not just going to show up in India right. and get in a taxi and say, t you know, yeah. take me somewhere. I, I do plan ahead. Yeah. And I hire guides to show me around. Mm -hmm. um, I've met a wonderful guide in Mexico this year mm -hmm. that and I've been back three times with him that you know takes me around. And the other thing is I make friendships very easily mm -hmm. and I've learned how to talk I know how to talk to people. Sure. I ask a lot of questions. I'm a very curious person. Mm -hmm. And you know people from other cultures find that intriguing they love that I care mm -hmm. enough to ask questions and um, that I want to be their friend and it I tell you it's been very beneficial to me because I have a lot of contacts around the world yeah we're still friends um, you know they send me their mother's recipes for things or they or they say come on over my mom's going to teach you how to cook I mean it happens all the time to yeah. me and and I think I just have that's another gift I have is um, friendships. So, um, and you know, it's funny. Recently, someone asked me, "What? What is? Well, I, we can talk in a little bit. I am writing a book, which has been uh, the, yeah. the hard, most difficult <laughs> thing I've ever done. But uh, someone asked, what's, so what's the second book going to be? Yeah. And I said, oh, there's not going to be a second book. No, it's no. all going into this it's, one. It's, I'm over that. Yeah. And she said, Shannon, imagine there's a second book. Mm -hmm. What's the title? What is the title of your second book? Yeah. And I, it, it came so quickly to me. I said it would be a children's book, and it would be titled How to Make Friends. Yeah. 
because I I think I know how to do that. Right. And I think children need to know how to do that yeah, at a young sure. age. Mm -hmm. um, so. Yeah, it, it goes back to, I mean, everything you just said, right? It goes back to building relationships, but also the one thing I love that you said was, you know, you're generally curious, right? But that also comes from the passion that you have for cooking because mm -hmm. you're eager to learn and you want to learn because you have this, this, this passion and this kind of, you know, love for cooking, which also centers back to building friends because then you get to host people and build more friendships. And it's just this amazing circle that works out, but it comes from you genuinely caring and av having proper interest in what they're right. doing, which most people, you know, especially I think coming from an American, right? When American travels, you know, a cliche American, I'm saying here, just a general American, they don't ask questions. They right. say, I want this because I get this back home. I know I'm going to eat steak mm -hmm. somewhere, right? And they order steak and fries or whatever. They very rarely do you, do, does the average typical American who travels try the local cuisine. Whereas you come from it from a, how do you make that? Like, right. that tastes incredible. Like, I want to learn how to make that. Mm -hmm. And then you learn all this process. And then you come back here and teach it to people here. That's true. Which is and, awesome. it, and it goes even further than that. They tell me, you know, my, my mother taught me to make this. Well, tell me about your mother. Yeah. You know, I mean, similar to what you, you, you mm -hmm. know how to interview people. I don't yeah. know that I know how to interview, but, but I genuinely, genuinely yeah. care. Mm -hmm. I want to know, I want to hear about your mother. And then I get some other story and then I get another recipe or, and I'm, it's, it, it's almost, I'm not going to yeah. say it's like a game, but I just figured it out. Yeah. So with the travel thing then, uh, you said 52 countries. What two questions? Uh, what was the country that surprised you the most, and then what country's next on your list that you haven't been to yet? Um, that surprised me most. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one was Israel. I've I've been there five times, and the first two times, you know, I went with a, a, a biblical historical tours. Mm -hmm. Uh, which was all fine and good, and it was interesting and educational. Um, but, you know, I found myself, you know, staring at the breakfast buffet in the hotel, yeah. which was actually phenomenal, mm -hmm. all these fresh vegetables. And, and the whole time I'm thinking, I want to know about this food. Who made this? Yeah. Where did this come from? How did they get this ingredient? What is that little berry? You know, th I'm thinking right. this, and I'm, you know, sneaking off and asking questions to the, you know, the mm. waitresses and things, which I love to talk. I love, when I go into a restaurant, even the fanciest restaurants, mm. I like to talk with the staff. You know, yeah. that's, that's where you go. They know everything. Stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. And so, on my third trip to Israel, I actually spent most of my time in Tel Aviv. Mm -hmm. And which most people don't, you know, all these, you know, uh, biblical or sure. historic, they don't, they don't, they land in Tel Aviv and then they go straight to Jerusalem. Yeah. But I tell people, go two or three days early and hang out in Tel Aviv. It's completely different. It's very, you know, modern city and the food scene is incredible. And I've made some great friends in Tel Aviv. In fact, one is coming next month. And we are doing an Israeli dinner together yeah. um, next month uh, with with this guy. But I would say, and then I, I mean, it was so great. I went back two more times and yeah. and have been all around, uh, in, in, including Jerusalem. So mm -hmm. now I've also been in Jerusalem for the food scene there uh, in Nazareth. You know, which you know, we yeah. if, you, if you know anything about the Bible, you've heard of Nazareth. Right. But I've been there and met one of the best chefs I've ever met was mm. in Nazareth and it's a woman so I yeah. that was probably one of the most surprising places yeah and then which one's next where where, have you, where haven't you been I'm, that you really want to go to oh uh, where I have not been um would that I I mean my bucket list is short mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'll be honest I mean if I if today was my last day on this you've earth, lived a pretty good life I would right? say I've done it <laughs> yeah I, uh, but I want to go to South Africa okay um I, the, I've read a lot about the food scene there, mm -hmm. and of course the wine um, is extraordinary, so that's one place I would really like to go. Mm -hmm. um, someday I want to do an African safari, and I'm talking a really proper one. Yeah, proper one. Yeah. I, I've done some, you know, out in Rwanda, sure. uh, but that's and that would not be food centered. That's just a yeah. cultural thing. Um, but 
you know, it's it's really short, mm -hmm. and there's no place. I want to go back to Australia. Mm -hmm. I've been there twice, and I I really really loved yeah. Australia. Um, but I'll, another surprising country I would say is, is Mexico. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I that's the other thing I try to tell people, especially here in Oklahoma. It's so easy to get yeah. there. It's so quick. It is safe. There, Mexico is a massive country, mm -hmm. and every little square mile is different from yeah. the other. Mm -hmm. um, and the food is not what we have here. <laughs> yeah, it's not Tex-Mex. <laughs> right. It's actual, authentic, right. real food. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's funny. Some of the, the time I, I interviewed um, one of the, uh, a guy who writes, um, he's a writer for a magazine in Oklahoma City, but he does do food writing as well on the side. And we spent an hour talking about, you know, the great Mexican restaurants, the real great Mexican mm -hmm. restaurants in Oklahoma City, and there, and he was diving into like even the region, right? Not just the city, but just uh, or the cities, but just like the region, and everything it's from. And we had a wonderful chat. It was uh, it was eye opening for sure. But it, it's the places where, you know, these have the best tacos or the best tamales, and and you like you never heard of these places, or it's the stigma of you shouldn't go down there, or you know, not at night, but it's worth traveling for these you know this great food. And you know you get to see it from from the region itself, and you get to travel and meet these people. Yeah. And by having you know relationships in these places, you probably get in the, get the experience that a lot of people generally don't get because they haven't built the relationship right. that you've built, which is awesome. Um, but tell me a little bit about the book that's coming out. Tell me a little bit more about that. So uh, my book is I've been working on it about three years. Mm -hmm. Well, I've been writing it for three yeah. years based on many years of, of experiences. Mm -hmm. But it is a cookbook. In a travel memoir, really, uh, and it's got 12 chapters, and mm -hmm. each chapter is um, centered on a place mm -hmm. from where I've been and cooked. Um, and I, I used to say it's based on a country, mm -hmm. but um, but there's one chapter that is Peru, Argentina, and Chile. Yeah. I started to call it South America, but then I looked at a map. I'm like, you know what? There are a lot of countries. There's a lot of countries down there. Yeah. I can't do that. Yeah. Um, and then another that is not a country. Well, two. One is Caribbean, mm -hmm. which uh, again also covers a massive yeah. amount of the the history of the Caribbean is so mm -hmm. fascinating to me. <clears throat> and then uh, Santa Fe, New yeah. Mexico, is one chapter because, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a I've been going there my whole life. Yeah. And um, the the food there is unique, very mm -hmm. unique in itself. So that mm -hmm. will be one, one chapter. But it's it's going to be a beautiful book. Uh, it's called The Hidden Table, mm -hmm. based on all the hidden tables that I have uh, dined at, and all including uh, you know fire pits and bars and cutting tables and all of yeah. it, it encompasses a lot of different hidden. Mm -hmm. tables and stories yeah. but uh the photography is magnificent i we've worked on that for many years mm -hmm. and still almost there we photographed all the food mm -hmm. all the recipes uh which is about 120 yeah and uh we're almost there almost it's there it's hard um so do we have a deadline on the book do you are you working towards that and the, the, the book is going to come out at my goal is well since I'm self-publishing, yeah. it's kind of my own pace. Which but is a good and a bad thing, right? <laughs> it's a good and bad thing. Yeah. But I have two editors that are actually three editors that I'm working with, and they are kind of my accountability. But we're, we're working toward the end of this year, uh, which is in two months. Mm -hmm. uh, the manuscript will be finished. Awesome. And, of course, then it goes to designers and yeah, yeah. Uh, all of that. So next fall, okay. I hope to have a book in in my hand. Yeah, and that will be on the website, ChefShannon.com. It'll be on the website, ChefShannon.com. Okay. I'm going to do a, a book tour you yeah. know, around the U.S. and hopefully uh, sell some books that yeah. way. One of the things that I think you know, is a lost art and, and you've seen it by traveling, but the thing that, you know, it, it's the fact that, like, nobody dines for a significant amount of time anymore, right? It's so right. fast-paced. It's like... You know, some people don't even sit at the dinner table anymore. And it's one thing that, you know, you just, when you go to a restaurant that actually provides that experience, or you come here with you and you put mm -hmm. on a show and you get educational base, but you get so many people here and, and you, you host and you build an atmosphere, it goes back to what you mentioned earlier about, you know, food brings people together, right? And yeah. that just, you know, it's, it's not, it is about the food. 
but it, the bigger thing is about getting people in a room together, right? And like the, the relationships you build from that. Food is the vehicle towards that. That's right. I wish we could get back to that. You more. know, it's, and I love the, to hear stories about the relationships that have formed mm-hmm. at my dinners and at my cooking classes. Yeah. There a lot of, you know, business relationships have formed. Mm-hmm. Uh, people have been hired by other yeah. people. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm not sure there have been any dating um, <laughs> relationships <laughs> yeah, formed, yeah. but I would love to hear if that happened. But right. it really, um, it, it's incredible the friendships that have formed through my dinners. And sometimes they'll come back, you know, the next time together, you know, two women because they met at the previous one. Uh-huh. So it's it's true. Food does bring people together, and I try to make it a very comfortable and welcoming environment here uh, to so that relationships yeah. do happen. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, it, again, like food is, you know, the amount of people that I've met, like to what you just said, the amount of people you meet at dinner, right, and you've had that experience mm-hmm. as someone has hosted a dinner. Um, a friend of mine the other day, I did a podcast with a guy, and he said to me, He's now a friend, and he said, what are you doing on the weekend? I said, nothing. My wife's out of town. Great. I'm cooking. Come on over. And, you know, and I and then I'm thrown into this melting pot of, like, 10 people who I've never met before in my mm-hmm. entire life, all different ages, all different kind of backgrounds. You know, we have – he cooked for everybody, and then we went out and had a great night. I'm like, this should happen more often, right? If it wasn't for people – it needs to be more people like mm-hmm. him that will just host because I think we've lost that, like – People now, like, don't like to host people at their houses, right? You know, it's right. just like, oh, do I really, you know, I don't want to host. I don't have to clean up. I don't have to mm-hmm. deal with people coming to my house because my dogs will go crazy or whatever. But I think they'd have such a better relationship with their friends if they did. Right? I, I agree. And I think, or I hope that people are doing it more. Yeah. I don't know. I don't get invited Mm-hmm. To be and you know, of course, I'm told that people are intimidated to cook for me, which I, I hate <laughs> hearing that because right. it's, it's not, not about, about the food. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but uh, you know, I think younger people mm-hmm. are are starting to do it. Um, I know I have a daughter that's 28 or 27, and she and her friends get together and cook. Of course, she cooks because yeah. I taught her how to right. do it. Um, but I think it's becoming you know a little more trendy mm-hmm. but at the same time as you know it is a lot of work yeah and it can be intimidating but i agree with you i wish more people would do it yeah definitely uh finishing up then what i guess is your kind of i don't know top tips or words of wisdom for people listening that think maybe they've never cooked before in their entire life they want to get into it or i don't know just what do you tell people <laughs> um it, this is what i tell people you can learn anything on YouTube. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it. even I do it. Sometimes I, I don't um, butcher a chicken, not butcher a chicken. I don't cut up a whole chicken that yeah. often. But when I do, I have to refresh my memory by yeah. going to a YouTube video. And so that's one way to learn how to cook. Mm-hmm. I know there are a lot of cooking shows out there. I don't watch them because I just don't have the time. Um, but... You know, that's one way. But another thing I like to encourage people to do is find a friend that wants to learn to cook, too, and learn together. Choose one cookbook and say, we're going to cook 10 recipes out of this book and do it that way. And that way you're learning with someone or form a little dinner group, you know, and do. And and I know people that do do that. A lot of couples do that. And each couple brings a dish out of a particular cookbook mm-hmm. or a particular cuisine. Yeah. So that's that's one way. Just pra- it's practice. Mm-hmm. Like anything else, like golf. Yeah. You're not going to become good at it unless you practice. Right. And you're going to screw up a lot. Mm-hmm. So just know that. Yeah. YouTube's the greatest resource. It is. Right? It's just, and it's, everyone's got it. It's so easy. Well, thank you so much for taking some time to share some stories. Uh, excited to hear more from, from listeners that have followed you or got involved. Maybe they'll come to one of your events. Uh, for people listening, the link is below to Shannon's website, chefshannon.com. And then go to her Instagram. It'll also be linked below, but at Chef Shannon Smith. You can check out awesome Instagram content. You've got a great following and built a great brand through Instagram as well. And uh, we'll catch you next episode. Cheers.
Hope you guys enjoyed that great episode. Thank you so much for listening. As always, huge shout out to our sponsors, the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, sharing an Oklahoma story through its people since 1927. For more information on the Oklahoma Hall of Fame, go to www.oklahomahof.com and follow them on Instagram for daily updates at Oklahoma HOF. Our other sponsor, the Chickasaw Nation, amazing sponsor. They do amazing things for the state and they're always sponsoring something in Oklahoma. They're a huge supporter of Oklahoma and without their support, we wouldn't be able to do what we do. And finally, our third sponsor for today, the Oklahoma 988 Mental Health Lifeline. 988 is the direct three-digit lifeline that connects you with the trained behavioral health professionals that can get all Oklahomans the help that they need. Learn more by visiting 988oklahoma.com. It's 988oklahoma.com. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. We are inspired by those around us and hope that you are too. Make sure you subscribe to this podcast on your favorite podcast platform and leave us a review so we can keep telling your stories. For more great Oklahoma content, follow This Is Oklahoma on Facebook and Instagram.